uh, so glad that you're here today. I have a question uh, for you, and uh, hopefully it's not too personal. Hopefully you're honest in church because it is church, and, and hopefully you're not too embarrassed about it and would like, like actually participate and like raise your hand and all. Um, have you ever been ripped off financially? Like someone took advantage of you financially, maybe a business deal that went south and, and you come to realize that somebody you were counting on actually like betrayed you and like took the money maybe. Um, I uh, bought some things uh, about almost going on two years ago now and I ordered it online and it was actually two video projectors that I purchased personally. And I ordered online and I got confirmation for the order. I got tracking numbers so I could track the shipments and all that. And, and I figured, okay, it's going to show up in, you know, 10 days, a week to 10 days or something like that. It was coming from Canada, those Canadians. And so, so I ordered it and, and it's supposed to show up and it doesn't show up. So I figured, well, I'm going to look at my emails, check the tracking says it was shipped. It's stuck in Ohio. I'll give it a couple more days. A couple days go by. It still hasn't shown up. I go online. I type in the tracking number and it's no longer in Ohio. It just says canceled. I was like, what is going on? Right. And so, so I call them and I say, Hey, what, what are you a boot to send? I was like, what do I do for these Canadians? Right. And so, so then uh, they say, Oh man, it's our mistake. It's uh, okay. We'll, we'll resend it. Right. And so, so uh, they send me another tracking number. And so I'm, I'm following this one and it doesn't show up. And so I check the tracking number and, and it says it was delivered. I'm like, where, where did they send it to? It's not at my house. So I call them. I say, it says delivered, but honestly, I don't have it. And they're like, oh, we sent you the wrong tracking number. That was for another order. We're sorry. Here, we'll resend it. We'll get it right. And so, so, so then they send me another tracking number. And again, it doesn't show up. And so by now, after all of this time has gone by, it's nearly six weeks that I've been waiting on this, right? And so I call them. I say, I, I I have to buy it locally. I have to do something else. I've got an event coming up. I'm going to just cancel the order. Give me my money back. I'm sorry. We can't do that. We're filing bankruptcy. So I was like, okay, if any of you are Canadian, um, just meet me in the parking lot afterwards. I have a, a score to settle. Um, but if, here's the thing is that they said, this is, this is what the guy said. And I said, well, what about my money? Too bad. That's what he said to me. He said, too bad. And I said, oh, if you weren't in Canada, I'd drive and see you right now. But, but here's the thing is that many of us have experienced something like that where you have been taken advantage of financially. Or maybe you hired somebody to do some work and, and you paid them 50% up front and then you never saw them. They were supposed to get material. They were supposed to start the job. They disappeared. You know, some of you are in a, a contracting business, and uh, I was talking to someone here that actually is in the pool business, and he said a lot of his business that he gets are other pool companies that have uh, cheated people and not finished a job, and now he gets hired to actually finish what they started. And so all of us are, are familiar with that, where somebody uh, takes advantage of people financially. And then if you think about this world we live in and the Bernie Madoffs of the world. If you don't know who Bernie Madoff is, he was a, a stock trader and people would uh, uh, give him their entire uh, retirement accounts and savings accounts to, for him to invest it and to grow their money financially and, and be able to retire. And, and he stole it. He would take from these people and uh, uh, reported it wrong and gave them fake reports on, on money that they were making. And he took millions and millions and millions of dollars from people. And maybe that, you know, maybe that hasn't directly happened uh, to you, but, but maybe you've been at a store and there was a commission salesperson. I was in commission sales, so I can say commission salesman, right? And so, so the, maybe you're familiar with that where the salesperson to get commission would tell you whatever you wanted to hear about the product, make the sell, and then you go home and the product doesn't do what you asked. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, whatever you were expecting it to do. The eye cream did not make you 10 years younger, right? Or whatever it is. <laughs> I'm not saying personal experience, I'm just saying. And so, so, so you've experienced that where somebody deceived you, lied to you to get money out of you. And, and, and this is what I want to talk about. Because of those experiences we see, oftentimes wealthy people are viewed negatively 
because if they are wealthy, they have cheated somebody, they've taken advantage of, they have mistreated people to acquire that wealth. And we can have a very negative view of successful, but automatically we just wonder, right? Like, 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 like we know that maybe there's some wealthy people that, that are good people, but I mean, I've never met one and they're not, I mean, who they are, I don't know, right? And we can have this negative view, but we get this idea. And this is what I want to talk about for today's uh, uh, message in this topic. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about this. But write this down. Money is the root of all evil. And, and you've heard that. And, and there's been messages about it. And, and maybe you were uh, mistreated at work and not given a promotion or somebody else stole something from you. And the idea that, well, gosh, all, all of this, they, they just love money and, and they want money and money corrupts people. Money is power and people with money are bad. And that's very common in our culture to just lean towards that kind of mentality. And we've heard, you know, the Bible says and God says money is the root of all evil. Here's the thing is God never said that. Now you're thinking, yeah, yes, because there's a scripture about it, Pastor, and you don't know what you're talking about. Here, let's look at, this is actually what uh, scripture uh, says. 1 Timothy 6.10 is where this idea comes from. And it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. See, the Bible doesn't say, God doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And you know people in your life that have loved money and have then made bad choices to gain that money in ways that aren't honest, in ways that are bad, and it ruins people's lives. And it is evil to do that. And so the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then the verse goes on to say, and some people, not all, but some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So this is, this is the truth, and this is what we see in our world, is that when people love money, that it never turns out good for them. You know, we see celebrities, we see uh, wealthy, successful people, we see business people, maybe uh, uh, owners of companies and corporations, uh, successful musicians. They, they have some of the nicest cars, some of the nicest houses. Uh, they go on the vacations you dream about and wish you could go on, but it costs too much money and you can't take off work because you need the paycheck to pay your bills. But, but there are these people that have got all of those things that, that we think think would make someone happy and they're miserable. They don't know who they can trust in life. They don't know who their real friends are. Every time their uh, uh, siblings call them, they're asking for, you know, a handout. And, and, and rich people in our culture, in our society, we see example after example who, who the, the, the Bible is correct and says they experience many sorrows. But it's the love of money that produces that. And so the, the idea, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is the wrong view, the wrong idea to have. Money is evil. Oftentimes in our culture, we lean towards that idea. But God never said that. You know, there are some good rich people, and there are some bad rich people. There are some good poor people, and there are some bad poor people. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. In fact, there are some people that love money, but they don't have any. In fact, they love it, and they broke into a window to take yours. And now they're in prison because of the love of money. Not because they had any but they really wanted yours. And, and so it's the love of money that drives people oftentimes to do evil, evil things. And the Bible doesn't say money's the problem. The Bible says greed is the problem. The Bible says that it's the heart and the attitude towards money that is the problem. And, and so the, the money is neutral. Money can be good. Money can be bad. Money, it depends on how you're using it. You can uh, gain it in 
evil ways and then use it for evil things, or you can gain it in righteous ways and use it for righteous things. Money isn't the issue. It's the heart and it's the greed that some people have for money. So, so God doesn't say money is evil. God doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And what does God say about money? This is one thing that God says. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich. Say rich. rich. And it goes on to say, and he adds no sorrow with it. Okay, so we just read two verses where the love of money causes many sorrows and where the blessing of God makes rich with no sorrows. And so it's possible to be rich and wealthy in a godly way that is beneficial to you, that doesn't bring sorrow and heartache into your life. There's a godly way to acquire it. There's a godly way to use it and manage it and spend it and invest it that is actually beneficial and good for people. And and this is why I want to address it because if we automatically have this negative view to success, to wealth, to riches, we, we think that's evil, avoid it because it's corrupting people then you're going to miss out on what the Bible says is the blessing of God that makes you rich. You're you're, you're going to reject some of the good things God has in your life because you you don't trust yourself, you don't trust money, and and you just kind of move away from it. And you're going to miss out on actually being able to be a blessing in other people's lives if you do that. In fact, this is what it says in Psalm 35, 27. It says, let the Lord be magnified. And this is great. It says, who has pleasure... In the prosperity of his servants. Okay, so what that just said is that when God's servants are successful and they prosper, it makes God happy. Okay, so if if the blessing of God makes somebody rich without any sorrow, and if God is pleased and has pleasure when you prosper then how could that be a sinful thing? Is God up there, yay, they're sinful. No, that doesn't make any sense. And, and, and so we have to have the proper view of finances and money and wealth and blessing because if not, we're never going to fully step into the blessing that God really has for us. So, so this is some things God says about money. If you're taking notes, write this down. God says, don't serve money. He doesn't say don't have it. He says, don't serve it. And and, and so this is what uh, uh, Jesus talking about in Matthew 6, 24 says. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and the devil. Wait, that's not what the Bible says. See, oftentimes we think that that is our choice, like, like uh, well, I'm not going to be a devil worshiper, so, I'm, so I must be good with God, right? And, and most of us have a heart where we want to please God, where, where we have grown up in a culture that is um, uh, influenced by uh, belief and faith and scripture, and, and so we don't want to be a Satan worshiper, right? And so, so we're not going to do that, but yet there's a lot of people that serve money. And the Bible doesn't say it's just this choice between God or the devil, The Bible says it's this choice between God or money. And there's people that would never, never serve Satan, but yet they choose to serve money. I was thinking about that. um, People that choose to serve money. And how do you know if you're serving money? Well, if it's your master, if you're obeying what your bank account says instead of what God says, then that would be serving money. See, there are some people that their choices and their thing, the, the, the direction of their life is directed by the finances that they have. Well, that's kind of serving money. And maybe God would put it on your heart to tithe and you, well, I can't because my bank account counts. Uh, my, my job says I can't because my income and this. And, and, and so we're letting money determine our actions instead of being obedient to God. Uh, you know, there are some people that would choose to do a job they hate and can't stand and are miserable because it pays good. Wait a minute. God created you for a purpose. God gave you talents and abilities. Don't throw that away because somebody's offering you a paycheck. The Bible says don't be a hireling. And so there, oftentimes we would never serve Satan, but we allow this money to give us orders in life and we just follow it. 
And the Bible says you can't serve God and money. God also says this about money if you're taking notes. God says don't pursue money. You know, some people, that is the driving force of their life. Uh, the only reason they got a college degree was to get a better paycheck. The only reason they moved to the city was to get a, be, you know, a better job. And they're pursuing money. They're looking for oftentimes even a get-rich-quick scheme. They're trying to take advantage of people. They're willing to trade relationships for income. They're pursuing money. Oftentimes people pursue money, but this is what Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 6 to say. He says, so don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Those possessions and nice things. He says, for the pagans do what? They run after. They pursue these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. There's a different way to live, though. This is what he says. But what should we do? We should seek. We should pursue first his kingdom and his righteousness and live in poverty as monks. See, no, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, See, here's the thing is that oftentimes we think that it's this and or or this uh, um, either or, but it can actually be both and. And so it's possible to pursue God and still have nice things. See, put that verse back up where it's uh, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things that pagans or, or people far from God are pursuing to acquire these things will be added to you. It's not, it, there's not a problem having nice things. There's not a problem being wealthy or rich. But your priorities have to be correct. Your heart has to be right. You can't be a lover of money. You need to be a lover of God. You have to be pursuing God. And and the blessing of God then follows that and brings prosperity into your life. And it pleases God when you have it. And then it pleases God when you use it for a good cause. In fact, that's what Timothy writes about. This is what Timothy says. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, or through 19, says to Teach those, and that's what we're doing here. We're teaching those who are rich in this world. Okay, so who is that? Teach those who are rich in this world. So how do you define the rich in this world? In your mind, who is rich? Maybe you're thinking of that relative that doesn't give very good presents, but yet you know they've got plenty of money. Maybe you're thinking of the neighborhood that you drive down. You're like driving down the street and you see this neighborhood and you see their nice cars and their nice house through the gate. And you see that and you think, where do they work, right? Because I know all the businesses around here and where do all of those people work? And, And those are the rich people. And in our mind, we would say, this is how much I make. And so double it, triple it, quadruple it equals rich. And so we would put the line of rich right here. If I get a 10% raise, a 50% raise, that doesn't make me rich. Rich is more than that in our mind. Oftentimes, we arbitrarily get to set in our mind rich. And based on the economics of Texas, of America, of the century we live in, we would adjust that line accordingly. And rich in New York is different than rich in Burleson, right? And we move that line wherever we want. And and so what determines rich? And in our minds, we always think, well, I'm okay. I'm doing good, but I'm not rich. In the world, if you drove your car here today, you're rich. If you have air conditioning, you're rich. If you own a refrigerator, you're rich compared to the world. The, the, the amount of people that own their own vehicle is around 4 to 5% in the entire world. So if you own a vehicle, then you are in the top 5% of the population of the world. If you own two cars, you are in the top 1% of the population in the entire world. If you own two cars, a motorcycle, and a boat, and then you have this special enclosure to keep those things in because you have so much money, you can actually build a house for your boat, and you push a button and you drive your car in to be part of your house, then you're rich. There's places in uh, uh, Albania where we go where they don't have running water, 
They don't have electricity. They don't have uh, indoor plumbing or a bathroom. They don't even have an outhouse at their property. You're okay, okay? <laughs> You're doing all right financially. And so I say that because you've been given much and much is required. And Timothy says to teach the rich, so he's talking to us, he's talking to you. You qualify for the rich that Timothy's talking about. He says, tell them this, teach them this, don't be proud and don't trust in your money. We have this uh, opportunity and this temptation because of the wealth of the nation that we live in to stop trusting God and to start trusting the economics of our culture, to start trusting the political system to make good business choices in order to make my financial success possible, not God. We have this tendency to think that I got the right education, I can you know, apply at these places, I can use these skills, I can do these things, and I can gain wealth and I can gain money because we have an economic system here that's working in our country in a way that I can do that and I can trust that and not God. And what Timothy is saying, tell the rich, don't be proud, don't trust your money. Why? Because it's unreliable. Money's fickle. The stock markets crash. Housing markets crash. You, you, you can lose that money like this. And it's not because you're bad and evil. It's actually uh, uh, the, the warning here is we want what's good for you. And don't put your trust in something that's unreliable. It's going to let you down. There's going to be many sorrows if you go that route. But what should we do? Their trust should be in God. Why? Because he richly gives us all we need for what? Our enjoyment. There's nothing wrong with enjoying nice things. There's nothing wrong with having a motorcycle and a boat. There's nothing wrong with having a house that protects those things. Nothing's wrong with you enjoying those things. God's pleased. There's pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. But your heart has to be right. And there, there's some more things that we need to be doing with money. Like this, verse 18, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Nothing's wrong with having great things. Nothing's wrong with being wealthy and rich, but we should be using that to do good things and to help people. That we should be recognizing that this came from God and I'm going to use it to benefit people. So, so the wrong view, the, the wrong idea is that money is evil. That's not what we see in scripture. This is the correct view. If you're taking notes, write this down. Money is a blessing from God and a tool to be used for him. That's the correct way to think about money. The, the correct way to think about money is that it is a blessing from God and it is a tool to be used for him. I was thinking about this. Uh, J.C. Penney's, y'all know the this department store, J.C. Penney's, uh, Mr. Penny um, that uh, founded it actually was a believer and loved Jesus. And when his company grew and as it grew, he was always, always, always a tither and a generous person. Even the company itself tithed when, when, when he was in charge and did lots of uh, uh, generous things to help people even from the company. Well, it came out towards uh, the latter years of his uh, life that he actually had been living for years and years and years reverse tithing. He would give away 90% and live on the 10%. That, that's a good way to use your riches and your finances and your money. Um, Rick Warren, uh, a great pastor, great author, written a Purpose Driven Life and Purpose Driven Church, uh, some of the uh, best-selling books. In fact, Purpose Driven Life is the top-selling Christian book other than the Bible. Okay, that's, that's not a bad record to have, right? right? That's, a, that's a lot of books, right? And, and it's good. It's helped a lot of people. Whenever that income and that wealth came, he still lives in the same house that he used to live in. He stopped taking any paycheck from his church, his salary. He gave it up. And the church had been about 26 years old, and he went back and repaid everything the church had ever paid him as a salary. See, oftentimes we think look, man, the rich people are greedy. They're, the re, they, they take advantage of people. No, there's lots of examples of God blessing people and people using those resources to do good in this world. 
And that's what we should be about. Money is a blessing from God, and it's a tool to be used for Him. So in, in your life and in my life, I want to give us a couple of points on the proper way to use money as a tool. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Invest in your character, not your comfort. Invest in your character, not your comfort. You know, it's interesting if you do a... Uh, uh, analysis of your spending. Uh, there are some tools online like mint.com and other uh, uh, r- r- financial resource tools that track your spending, and it can break it down in categories, and, and it breaks it down into utilities and, and uh, different uh, credit card payments or entertainment or, or groceries or gas, and it can give you this pie chart and show you all of it. But, but think about how often we use money for things that are comfort us instead of things that build our character. You know, think, think about even within the dynamics of the church where we have an opportunity to go to a men's event, but it's going to cost $80, and you're thinking, $80? No way. But then you're going to spend it to go do something else. And so you're choosing comfort and go see the Cowboys win because that's what the Cowboys do, right? And, and, but, and so you, you, you spend $300 for seats to go see a Cowboy game, but $80 to, to go to a men's conference to learn about God and to worship with other men. Gosh, I just don't have the money for that. We, we choose comfort over things that build our character so often in life. Well, gosh, I, I can't tithe, but I, I, I can have cable and I can have Netflix and I can have Hulu and I can have, well, I'm going to, well, that's because I use those to relax and I have a hard job. You don't understand because, because I work hard and then when I come home, I want to relax and, and I'm going to invest in these. No, choose to spend your money and invest in things that actually build you and grow you, make you a better leader, make you a better spouse, make you a better parent, make you a better entrepreneur. Buy a book, okay? Buy a book that teaches you some marketing principles. Buy a book that teaches you how to be organized. Buy a book about time management. Do some things that build your character. Invest in those things because God can bless that. You sitting there watching Game of Thrones for, for four hours, or, or 12 hours or, or four days or whatever it may be. You're, you're binging on that. No, invest in something that builds your character, not just your comfort. You know, I was thinking about that uh, even with uh, what we do here at the church. We have OC studies where OC studies, oftentimes we keep that as cheap as possible so that the people don't have an excuse to say, oh, gosh, I just can't. $10, people, $10 to come to a class, maybe sometimes $15, something like that, 10 to $15 for six weeks to invest in your character for six weeks. Well, God, I don't have the time, and man, $15, we're really strapped right now. Are those new shoes? They look really nice on you, right? Okay, so here you, so the thing is, is no, invest in your character. Okay, your learning doesn't end when you graduate from school. You, you got some learning to do. You can grow. Invest in your character, invest in building yourself up. This is what the Bible says, uh, Isaiah 55, 2 says, Why spend your money on something that is not real food? Why work for something that doesn't really satisfy you? Listen closely to me and you will eat what is good. Your soul will enjoy the rich food that satisfies. You know, whenever we uh, seek comfort and we try to purchase things that we think are going to make us comfortable, it's so short-lived. It never really satisfies anything. There always has to be that next thing, the next vacation, the next whatever, and you're never really satisfied. But when you start investing in your character and building you, there's something very satisfying about that. Number two, if you're taking notes, this is how we can use money as a tool in a God-honoring way. Number two, invest in people, not in possessions. Invest in people, not in possessions. You know, think about that even with your family. Uh, there are a lot of studies that it's better for you to spend your money on experiences as a family instead of things for your family. You know, it's much better instead of having your kids dressed the best and having the new electronics and, and you buying them toys, hopefully not because you feel guilty of something about a parent, but, but, but anyway, that's another uh, class. Uh, but here, but, but it, it, you know what's better than actually possessions and giving them things? Spend that money to invest in yourselves as a family and go experience something together. 
build some memories together. That, that's going to benefit you better. When you invest in people instead of possessions, it's always better for you. Yeah, I was thinking about that with uh, even uh, the OC studies that we do or the connect groups that we do. Uh, one of the things that I've loved is even the men's conference that we've gone to before, the men say, I want to buy someone else a ticket. And they invest in people. And they say, I'll pay the $80 so that this guy can go. You know, we, we, we do uh, missions outreaches in Albania. And at the end of this year, we're going to be receiving a special offering for mission work that we do in Albania. And for people to say, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to leverage my finances to actually invest in people and make a difference in people's lives instead of just that new thing or that possession that I could get. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put off buying that new car. I'm going to put off getting that new TV. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait on these possession things, and I'm going to use my finances in a way that actually invest in people. It's always better for us when we do that. When you lead a, uh, a connect group or you have a connect group or a part of a connect group and you spend money on food and bring and have fellowship with people, you're investing in people instead of possessions. There's a way for you to invest in people. This is what the Bible says, Luke 16, 9. It says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That is one of the most misunderstood verses of the Bible that Jesus says. Because he says to do what? Use your worldly wealth, use money, use riches to gain friends for yourself. Is he talking about buying friends? <laughs> like, like go on uh, Amazon and double click on uh, like the profile of the friend that you want and two days later they show up, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pay off people to like me. No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. In fact, that verse where it says, uh, gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, if you read it in context, the it that is gone is not the money. The it that is gone is your life. That when your life comes to an end, that when your life is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What it's talking about is using your money to invest in people because one day when this world ends and you transfer from here to eternity, there's going to be friends there that you affected, that you invested in. There are going to be people that come to know Christ and are in heaven because of what you did to invest in people. That's what that's talking about. And so we need to invest in people, not in possessions. You know, you've heard it said, and the Bible doesn't actually say this. God never said this, but it is true. And the principle is in the Bible. You can't take it with you, right? You've heard that. You can't take it with you. And that's true. You're never going to see a hearse with a U-Haul behind it, right? You can't take it with you. But here's the thing is you can send it ahead. The Bible says that you and I can't take it with us, but the way that we use our resources now, we can be done in a way that invests in eternity and that we can send it ahead so that when we get to heaven, there's a reward for what we did here. And we can't take it with us, but what we do now can be done in a way that sends it up ahead. If you're taking notes, number three. This is the uh, third way that we can use our finances, our money, our wealth, our riches in a way that is a tool for him. Number three, invest in worship, not in waste. Invest in worship, not in waste. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You know what? Anytime you and I use our resources for these earthly things, and we don't invest in the uh, uh, godly things. We don't use it in a godly way for things that uh, uh, last for eternity. And we use it for the temporary things. We use it for our comfort. We use it uh, for our possessions. We use it for that. It's wasted. It gets destroyed. There are things in this world that eat it up. You buy the new iPhone 10 that comes out for $1,300, and then you drop it, and the screen still breaks. It's still, uh, you, you wait, you, you, by the time you get a computer and you take it home and you figure out how to connect it to the internet, it's already old news, right? They've already come out with three updates since then. You buy a brand new computer and when you take it home, you can't use it for six hours because it has to run updates. It's new, right? 
The, the, anytime we invest or spend our money in these things, it's a waste. It says that the moth eat it, the, the vermin destroy it, thieves break in and steal it. The Bible gives us wisdom and says there's a better way to use our money. Verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that really gets to the heart of the matter. Ba-doom-psh. Is that, see, here's the thing is that it's a heart issue. It's not a wallet issue. It's a heart issue. You know, the Bible talks so much about finances, about general. Did you know that the Bible talks about the way you handle your possessions more than prayer? Did you know the Bible talks about wealth and riches more than heaven or hell? The Bible says so much about how you handle these resources that God has given you. And guess what? The reason why the Bible tells us to tithe, the reason why the Bible tells us to be generous and to give and to give to every good work and to be generous that way is not because God needs your money. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. And the Bible says where your money is, there your heart will be also. And the reason why God talks about money so much is because he loves you, wants a relationship with you, and he wants to be connected to your heart. That's why it's so important to God. It's a heart issue. It's not a money issue. It's a heart issue. And so I'd ask you, are you using your money as a tool because you recognize it as a blessing from God? Or are you trusting in it? Are you using it for your own comfort? Are you using it for possessions instead of investing in people? And, and, and understand that it's a good thing to be blessed. It's a good thing to be rich. God is pleased when you prosper. But then how you handle it and what you do with it matters so much. God wants your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for this uh, challenging message. God, I pray that it has confronted us, but it has not condemned us. God, there's no guilt in any of this, but there is guidance in this. And God, if we have not been managing the resources that you've given us properly, God, I pray right now we make the changes necessary to acquire money in a godly way, to manage it in a godly way, and to invest it in a godly way so that you would be glorified. So that we are investing in the things that are eternal instead of the things that are temporary. And that God, as we do that, it shows that we can be trusted with the little and so we'll be trusted with the more. And that God, I pray that you would bless us even more and more. God, I pray that you would give us more wealth and more riches and more resources, not to consume on ourselves, but to use for your glory and to invest it into your kingdom purposes and to be able to make a difference in people's lives because lives matter to you and souls matter to you. So God, I pray that we use these resources in a way that helps and benefits people and glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand this morning.